Thank you very much for coming out on this cold and suddenly wintry night that um, has beset us, but I fully understand why you have. I think we're in for a wonderful evening. My name is Susan Elliott. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Engagement at the University of Melbourne. And I'd like to commence tonight, as it's a significant occasion for the university, in acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today, and also to acknowledge Indigenous elders past and present. Tonight, the Australia India Oration, Institute Oration, lives up to the standards of the orations we've had in the past. Not putting pressure on you, Peter. Um, we, the first oration was given in this room by the Honourable Kapil Sibyl from India and followed by one of his parliamentary colleagues the following year, uh, now Minister Shashi Tharoor. Last year, our Vice-Chancellor, Glyn Davis, spoke and this year, we have an outstandingly well-qualified speaker to address us. Peter Varghese AO is the head, as you would know, of our diplomatic service and our most recent um, High Commissioner to India. Peter's CV is so long that it would take too long to completely share it with you, but just to share some highlights born in Kenya, raised in Queensland, and then university medalist at the University of Queensland before pursuing a diplomatic career. He's had posts or postings at some of our most stimulating and exciting uh, embassies in Washington, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, and the delights of Vienna. Uh, before coming to what he described as possibly the most important uh, posting that could be uh, given to a diplomat, and that is India. When, India. when in India with Amitabh and with Peter, when Peter was still High Commissioner, we met with the Vice President of India, a remarkable um, man. He was a High Commissioner to Australia and he described, in about the 70s or 80s, I think the 70s, and he described arriving in Canberra and a note had been left to him by his predecessor. And he opened it and he said, the note said, I hope you enjoy your time in Canberra. The relationship between India and Australia has neither substance nor future. <laughs> um, so, so much has changed and Peter's came to the posting in Delhi at a time when India and Australia really were beginning to recognise each other across the Indian Ocean, particularly from this side of the ocean where Australia recognises the importance of India to not just our cricketing history but to our social, economic um, and other destiny. So it is with great pleasure that I invite to the podium Peter Vargates AO. Thank you. I'm all wired up, so um, thank you very much, Susan, for that very generous introduction, and you didn't miss a beat. Uh, Susan lost her speech between when she left and when she arrived, so I thought that was a very good performance. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. It's obviously a quiet night in Melbourne. Not much to do. Um, look, I'm... Uh, I'm very honoured to be invited to deliver the fourth Australia-India Institute oration um, and humbled to be following such a distinguished list of previous speakers. A uh, couple, Sybil, with whom I worked closely when he was India's Education Minister, Glenn Davis, who as Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University has been a strong advocate of education links with India, and Sashi Tharoor, whom I may be able to match in Malayali genes, but whose eloquence is, as I think you all know, in a league of its own. Um, 
This oration is one of many initiatives that the Australia-India Institute has taken to strengthen the bonds between Australia and India. The Institute plays an important role in expanding our understanding of the relationship and an encouraging discussion about its future direction. And I'd like to commend Professor Amitab Matu for his work in these areas, drawing as it does on an impressive network of contacts among India's foreign and strategic policy community. Uh, I can vouch for the fact that Amitab has well-placed contacts, including many former students throughout the Indian system. So to Amitab and to Robert Johansson, the chair of the Australian Indian Institute, I extend my very deep appreciation. In inviting me to deliver this lecture, Amitab suggested that I might want to talk about both my professional and personal association with India. So let me begin with some remarks <coughs> about my own journey with India. India was in my blood long before it was ever on my mind. My parents were both born and grew up in Kerala, in the south of India, members of a Syrian Christian community which insists, probably correctly, that it dates back to St. Thomas the Apostle. My parents, both now deceased, were unusual by any measure. And by the measure of their times, they were extraordinary. They were strong-willed risk takers. They both went from village to university, decided they would marry for love, not by arrangement, left India soon after their marriage to make careers as teachers in Kenya. And most extraordinary of all, took a family of nine children to a country across the world where they knew not a soul and for which they were given only a two-year visa. That country was Australia in 1964. The visa was for two years because the white Australia policy was still in place and my father, by then a senior principal in the Kenyan school system, came under a special program for distinguished Asians. So my connection with India is once removed. I've been a culinary Indian all my life, <laughs> and religion played a much bigger part in our upbringing than the culture of Kerala. All of us were taught from an early age to think for ourselves and to believe that there was nothing to which we could not aspire. The result was a clan of argumentative Australians. <laughs> when I went to India in 2009 as Australia's High Commissioner, I did so primarily for professional rather than personal reasons. My view then as now is that for an Australian diplomat, there could be no more exciting an appointment than to India. The reason was simple. India was the only big relationship which still had so much room for growth, which meant that a High Commissioner could make a real difference. With Australia's other large and much more established relationships, a head of mission may be able to shape 10 or 20 per cent at the margin. But with India, it seemed to me that number was more likely to be closer to 40 to 50 per cent. When I arrived in India in August of 2009, the student safety issue was reaching a crescendo, and, Indian media, and the Indian media immediately assumed that I had been cunningly sent because of my Indian background. Little did they know that such acts of cunning, or indeed imagination, would be rare indeed in our posting system. <laughs> so what I have to say tonight about India are not the words of an India expert, or even an expert on the bilateral relationship. Instead, they are reflections on what I observed during my time as High, Commissioner, as High Commissioner, leavened in part with the instinctive understanding which we sometimes arrogantly claim when something has been in the background of our lives for so long. The Australia-India relationship can be seen in three distinct phases. The period of empire, the decades between Indian independence, and the opening of the Indian economy in the early 90s, and thirdly, the years since then. I'm not including in these three phases our geological connection, because if you go back 300 million years, 
Australia and India were literally joined at the geological hip before continental drift separated us. The days of empire, from first settlement in Australia in 1788 to Indian independence in 1947, were actually remarkably close. In the early decades of our penal settlement, India was arguably our largest trading partner, linked through the infrastructure of the British Empire and sustained by a network of army officers and officials who made lives in both countries. The Sydney-Calcutta Sea Link was a vital supply chain. This was, however, for the most part, a connection with India, not Indians. When the relationship with Indians in an independent India did commence, it was narrowly focused, although many of the personal links continued. Seen from a state perspective, the stunted nature of the Australia-India relationship from the late 40s to the early 90s shouldn't surprise us. For the first four decades after India's independence, we inhabited different worlds. Our hard interests, strategic and economic, rarely intersected. India's economy went down the path of self-sufficiency, not global trade. Strategically, we inhabited different universes. India was a leading light of the non-aligned movement, comfortable with the high moral tone of its foreign policy. Australia was a paid-up member of the Western Alliance, a staunch ally of the United States. Today, some of that looks so different. India is in the top bracket of our international relations. We have committed to a strategic partnership. The economic relationship is booming. Our geostrategic interests are converging. We are finding more common ground in multilateral fora. A welcome, if still nascent, change from the days when differences over trade and non-proliferation soured a generation of Australian and Indian diplomats towards each other. And the rapidly growing Indian diaspora in Australia, now just shy of half a million, is forging links which will add much needed depth and texture to the people-to-people -people relationship. The turning point in all of this was India's 1992 decision, led by Narashima Rao and crafted by Manmohan Singh, to open its economy, a move which will be judged, in my view, by history as every bit as significant as Deng Xiaoping's decision to open the Chinese economy. The opening of the Indian economy did what decades of diplomatic endeavor could not. It put India on a glide path which would see it refine its economic, redefine its economic and strategic interests and in the process create a convergence of interests between our two countries which has a long way to run. This growing convergence applies to both our strategic and economic interests, the latter driven by a structural complementarity in trade and investment. Indeed, it is the economic relationship which, in my view, will be the load-bearing pillar of the relationship in the medium term. The Indian economy is on a growth path, even, it is, even if it is performing lower than expected. It is driven by domestic demand, high savings and good demography. It is a very different model to the East Asian success story in that it is not export-led. Its closest historical parallel is probably 19th century America. Indeed, the more one looks at India, the more one is struck by the similarity between India and industrializing America. Although the latter didn't have the statist history which is so much a part of India's political culture and which some would argue still holds it back. Still, there is in India an emerging sense of exceptionalism which has echoes of the US experience. Also, both are deeply religious societies which place a premium on individualism. India faces some very big economic challenges, both structural and current. Its private sector still doesn't have the headroom it needs to drive growth. The license Raj may no longer reign, but it often still rules. The challenges of land acquisition hobble infrastructure development, which in turn severely limits the capacity of the economy to grow and for manufacturing to be globally competitive. But for all its economic challenges and for all the frustrations that Indian economic reformers daily face, it is very unlikely that we will see a derailing of India's growth path over the next two decades. 
even on a little further reforms basis, pent-up demand and entrepreneurial flair will combine to clock up around 6% annual growth over this period. And the world's third largest economy, growing at 6% a year, is a transformational development. <clears throat> Those who lament that Australia has not paid enough attention to India miss the point that until India opened up its economy, there was not much that would have brought us together. Indeed, if anything, I think you could make the case that Australia in those first four post-independence decades invested more in the relationship than our underlying economic and strategic interests then warranted. That was certainly the case with our diplomatic representation in the 50s and the 60s, <clears throat> with the likes of Walter Crocker, Peter Hayden, James Plimsoll, Arthur Tang and Patrick Shaw serving as High Commissioners. They were the outstanding diplomats of their generation, hardly the roll call of the diplomacy of neglect. I recently reread Walter Crocker's 1966 biographical profile of Nehru, described by Ramachandra Gua, perhaps India's most impressive contemporary historian, as without question the best brief life of Nehru. It is indeed an insightful portrait from a sharp mind. But what struck me about that book was that it had nothing to say about Australia and India. Here was a book about India's longest serving prime minister, written by Australia's longest serving high commissioner, and not a word about the bilateral relationship. That tells us something about the nature of the relationship at that time. Australia took India seriously, recognized that it was a country which demanded attention, was willing to invest in the relationship, but even with all that, and bearing in mind that this was a period in our foreign policy when we had no diplomatic relations with China, we struggled to find traction in the relationship. The grip of strategic and economic interests just wasn't there, and the ties of history, language, and Commonwealth connections were not enough to compensate. This is all the more remarkable because at that time, India was one of the very few democracies in Asia. And Australian foreign policy was anchored in the hope that democracy would be a bulwark against communism, which was seen then as the biggest security threat to the stability of our region. Measured by the standards of the times, India's embrace of democracy was truly remarkable. Here was a country mired in poverty, largely illiterate, framed by the caste system, not naturally inclined to the spirit of egalitarianism. And yet its constitutional drafters insisted on one person, one vote. And it embedded in India's political culture the concept of the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, and the separation of powers. Some have ascribed India's choice of liberal democracy to a long tradition of public discourse and argument and debate. Amid a lifetime of invaluable insights, Amartya Sen, author of The Argumentative Indian, makes two points about India relevant here. On argument and the roots of Indian democracy, Sen says this, and I quote, the historical roots of democracy in India are well worth considering, if only because the connection with public argument is often missed through the temptation to attribute the Indian commitment to democracy simply to the impact of British influence. But India has been especially fortunate in having a long tradition of public arguments. When independent India became the first country in the non-Western world to choose a resolutely democratic constitution, it not only used what it has learnt from the institutional experiences in Europe and America, it also drew on its own tradition of public reasoning and argumentative heterodoxy." End quote. Separately, Sen has written, Pro prolixity is not alien to us in India. And for proof of that, incidentally, he points out to Krishna Menon's record, still standing after more than half a century, for the longest speech ever delivered to the United Nations, <laughs> nine hours long in January 1957. In March 1950, two months after India's proclamation as a republic, Nehru appointed mathematician and public servant Sukumar Sen, India's first chief election commissioner. In The Life and Death of Democracy, Australian-born academic John Keane 
spells out the numbers facing sen in an unprecedented experiment in democratic arithmetic. 489 federal seats, 3,375 seats in state assemblies, 176 million voters aged 21 and over, an electorate where only 15% of voters were literate, and something that can't be said for all nascent democracies, both women and men were able to vote. Sen needed 224,000 polling booths, 2 million steel ballot boxes, 16,500 clerks to maintain the electoral rolls, 56,000 presiding officers, 280,000 support staff, 244,000 police officers, and 400,000 files of indelible ink. And remember, this was 1950 when democracy was alien to Asia. Nehru won that election, which forged Indian democracy at a time when global democracy was far less deeply rooted than it is today. But for Nehru, as Keane goes on to write, democracy stopped at India's borders. Keane argues that it's an undeniable fact that democracies always fare better when they band together under a tent of multilateral cross-border institutions. But Nehru's profound suspicion of the United States and the free market led him and Indian foreign policy in a different direction. He chose the path of non-alignment. There is, of course, nothing inherently contradictory about a democratic nation choosing non-alignment. But the combination of non-alignment and a strong belief in the non-interference in the internal affairs of countries has meant that India has been cautious about promoting a broad democracy, a democracy or human rights agenda. It may continue to do so, but one of the fascinating questions about India's role in the world is how it will choose to navigate between interests and values. More broadly, what role will India play in global affairs? For Australia, that question is closely linked to where we place India in our regional compass. Increasingly, we are referring to our region as the Indo-Pacific, not because Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia are of any less importance to us than they have been, but because a new Indo-Pacific strategic arc is beginning to emerge, extending from India to Northeast Asia, including the sea lines of communication on which the region depends. As the Defence White Paper has made clear, the strategic importance of this broader region is being forged by a range of factors, not least of which is the growing impact of the Indian economy. India's economic interests are pulling it eastwards, and as it so shifts, it'll inevitably play a larger role in the strategic affairs of the region. The Indo-Pacific returns India to Asia's strategic matrix, while also embracing great powers like China, and key powers like Japan, Indonesia, and South Korea. It also includes the individual ASEAN countries and the collective economic and strategic weight of an evolving ASEAN community. Importantly, it also recognizes the, the strategically crucial role that the United States plays in the stability of the region. Globally, countries like China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and other emerging powers are moving from the periphery to the center of global political and economic affairs. The old lines of developed versus developing countries are much less real than they were even a couple of decades ago. And now these countries have emerged as influential participants in a new push to reform the international order. The broad contours of the 21st century international system are now apparent, even if the detail is not. A system populated by several power centers and, and competing conceptions of domestic and international order. A world in which no country or region or political or economic model will enjoy uncontested dominance. In such a world, we're likely to see a variety of shifting coalitions built around shared interests on specific issues. These groupings will sometimes appear to be more cohesive than they are. The idea of the BRICS, for example, has held currency for more than a decade, but in truth, there are big differences between the countries involved in that grouping. Some are strategic rivals, and even their economic interests are not always aligned. Increasingly, we see the relevance of the so-called IPSA grouping, that is India, Brazil, and South Africa. In some ways, a more coherent notion 
that brings together the democracies from among the major emerging powers. And they are commonalities of worldview that unite the major emerging powers, whether or not they're democracies. For those states that are emerging as major powers out of a history of colonial domination and a sense of relative strategic powerlessness, there is something shared in a worldview that looks at the established international order, settled by the dominant powers in the ashes of the Second World War, and asks how it might be reformed to reflect modern power relativities and their own greater economic prosperity. For some of these states, human rights and democracy are lesser matters, questions left to one side while the broader challenge of social cohesion and economic growth is pursued. In this environment, will India's economic weight translate into strategic influence? Does India have the strategic culture and institutions to support a more active foreign and strategic policy? As India addresses these questions, there are four factors which are likely to influence its choices. First, I think there is a domestic desire for India to play a greater role. The recent Lowy Australia India Institute poll, to which I'll refer again in talking about the Australia India relationship, had some interesting data on Indian views about security, particularly in the Indian Ocean. 94% of Indian respondents either agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that India should have the most powerful navy in the Indian Ocean. 88% of respondents thought India should do more to lead regional cooperation with Indian Ocean countries. 72% thought that the United States could be a good partner for India in the Indian Ocean region. And 56% thought Australia could be a good partner. I think all of that points to a domestic desire for India to play a leadership role in the region, if not globally. It also points to an Indian interest in working with other democracies. Second, if values were to play a more prominent role in Indian foreign policy, India's domestic democratic achievement would add considerable international credibility to such a choice. As the emerging powers take on greater ownership of the international order, we can go one of two ways. We can have a deepening of transparent, open, free market internationalism, the direction in which Australia has sought to move, or we can have an increase in closed systems, nations working only for their own benefit in a zero-sum world. Open rules, the rule of law, the free market, all are conducive to greater global growth and freedom. That has been Australia's clear experience, and our region as a whole will only benefit from more liberalisation. India has seen the benefits of reform too. The leadership of Prime Minister Singh, both in his current role and in that crucial time when he was finance minister, has made a significant difference to where India is today in its development and the prosperity of its people. Globalization, the reduction of protectionism, the expansion of trade, the greater movement of people, goods and capital, has been an immense benefit for our world. Further movement down that path would provide space for India to grow into a global power, while a pursuit of closed systems would stymie growth and hold India back. Writers like Gurucharan Das admire Nehru for his commitment to democracy, but rue the loss of two or more decades to statist assumptions and low growth. Thirdly, whatever the shape of the international order we craft this century, we need India's participation. The problems we face, climate change, resource depletion, development and so on, are not ones that can be resolved by any one country or even any one region. They require us to work together as international partners. Democracies are messy, but they produce resilient outcomes, and a regional and global order that did not include an active and engaged India, a quarter of the world's population, would struggle to achieve meaningful results. Our multilateral system is under intense strains. Look at the Doha round, or the struggle to find an international consensus on climate change. It is hard to, dr to drive reform in our world. We are too integrated and dependent on each other for any, any of us to take a beggar thy neighbor approach. India's choices will help shape the global outlook. If India takes on a more active role, Indian leadership could be an invaluable international public good
in the 21st century. And fourthly, the degree to which India chooses to be a positive, constructive player on the international stage will affect the extent to which its strategic power comes to match its growing economic weight. But in the end, will India actually play a more active international role? Some writers and thinkers are critical of Indian institutions, like its bureaucracy, its foreign service, and its education systems. India's bureaucracy was not built to support the demands of a great power. Today, it is under enormous strain. We need to calibrate our expectations of India. Its political culture is incrementalist. Its institutional capacity to respond to ambitious foreign policy agendas is limited. Its worldview is still anchored in its neighborhood, although its sense of status is justifiably in a global league. And no one pretends that India's challenges are not vast, that they are not still hundreds of millions living in poverty or without the benefits of education, literacy, and health. Our multipolar world is placing new demands on India, but what India's history shows ultimately is an overwhelming ability to embrace its contradictions, its flaws, and its diversity. Let me now return to the future of the Australia-India relationship. The key to building the Australia-India relationship is patience and realistic expectations. India has a way of punishing impatience. If we get the economic relationship right, the strategic partnership will follow, although there will be a long lag between when India arrives as an economic power and when it arrives as a strategic power. In my view, the Australia-India story will be broadly similar to the Australia-Japan story. Trade-led, commodities dominated, values influenced, and then broadening into a strategic partnership. India's changing sense of its strategic interests will bring it closer to Australia, but there will be limits to how far and how fast India will want to go in this direction. The concept of non-alignment still has a powerful hold on the Indian imagination. That is not to say that we will see a return to the foreign policy of the NAM days, but we are likely to see strategic autonomy as the anchor of Indian foreign and strategic policy, and India will likely remain not much inclined to the business of promoting democracy abroad. Indeed, I suspect Indian foreign policy will be essentially comfortable with the John Quincy Adams view of its place in the world, not to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, be the well-wisher to freedom and independence of all, but the champion and vindicator only of her own. None of this means that India's standing as a democracy is irrelevant. Indeed, I would argue that the liberal democratic character of India opens up more common strategic space between us. A rising democratic India is not generally seen as a strategic threat. And even as India's military capabilities increases, as inevitably it will, India's strategic behavior is unlikely to cause much anxiety. There is nothing in India's current strategic trajectory or in its, in its strategic doctrine which runs against core Australian strategic interests. So the idea of a strategic partnership between us is quite well anchored. This strategic partnership will, of course, be less than an alliance, but it'll be much more than a line in a communique. At its core will be a broadly shared view of the drivers of stability in Asia, including an inclusive and outward-looking regionalism. Building a strategic partnership is not just the task of governments. It asks a lot of business and civil society in both our countries. Of business, it asks that the private sector across our two economies work to expand the complementarities between a growing Indian economy and Australia's capacity to provide resources, goods, and services. Of civil society, it asks that we continue to find and build links between our two cultures and our national communities. Of government, it asks that we take on many challenges, negotiating a free trade agreement, expanding our defense dialogue, working together in the G20, the World Trade Organization, on climate change negotiations and on building Asian regional institutions, which will help us manage the strategic challenges we face. <clears throat> 
We're already taking on that challenge, of course, through evolving regional institutions like the East Asia Summit and the rather awkwardly named IRAC, the Indian Ocean Regional Organization. But on a more fundamental level, if we are to make our strategic partnership meaningful, we have to do more to understand each other better. The truth is that at a community level, neither of us know much about the other. The Indian elite has traditionally not looked to Australia. That is beginning to change, but only slowly. And for the broader Indian community, images of Australia tend to be sketched, tend to be sketchy, shaped by cricket, historical connections, and sporadic coverage in the Indian media. Similarly, in Australia, there is very little understanding of contemporary India in the wider community. Australians, for the most part, have only a partial glimpse of India's diversity and of the scale of its prospects. Both our, our communities are, I suspect, caught in a time warp in terms of our perceptions of each other. I saw this vividly during the Indian students issue in 2010. When the Indian student issue was at its peak, Australians were puzzled at the Indian media coverage. We couldn't recognize the country which was being portrayed in sections of the Indian media. I'm not here being critical of India's media. Some of its media is reflective of the broader global media culture of sensationalism and trivialization. It's not unique to India. Australia has its fair share of it. But the portrayal of Australia and India in 2010 reflected something deeper. A willingness by some, I hope not most, Indians to believe the worst about Australia on the question of race. In the last half century, Australia has made a remarkable transition from the days of the white Australia policy to becoming one of the world's most multicultural societies. This is not a transition that could have been made if the DNA of Australia was racist. If there was ever an example of the image of our nation being caught in a time warp, then this was it. 40 years on and still explaining that Australia is a multicultural and multiracial society. The recent Lowy AII poll that I mentioned earlier shows we still have some ground to make up in terms of building a better understanding of each other. Yes, the poll found 61% of Indians thought the crimes against Indian students were mostly caused by racism. But half of those surveyed also thought that most Australians were welcoming to Indian students. And overall, it found Indians were almost as well disposed, disposed to Australians as to almost any other country. Indian feelings were only warmer to the United States, Singapore, and Japan than to Australia. Indians still think that Australia has one of the best education systems in the world. Indeed, only that in the United States is more prized. So what that episode suggested to me was how important it is for both India and Australia that we modernize our perception of each other. Both our countries will benefit from greater collaboration. So it is in our interest to do away with misconceived notions of what the other stands for. What we achieve together in coming decades will have little to do with a shared imperial past. It will have not much to do with the English language, although that will help. And it will have to be a tighter bond than anything forged on a cricket field. Rather, it will have to do with gaining a real understanding of each other, of where we differ, but also what brings us together, including our converging strategic and economic interests and the strength of our diversity. <coughs> Let me conclude with these observations. I'm a long-term optimist about the Australia-India relationship, but building the strategic partnership will not happen quickly, not because its underlying logic is weak, but because we are starting from a relatively low base and there are real capacity constraints, and also because there is currently an inevitable asymmetry of ambition in the relationship which will take time to narrow. In this, Australia finds itself in the company of many others, eager to flesh out a stronger relationship, but held back by an Indian system which is not built to support the demands on a great power. Indian leaders are well aware of these challenges, and its political system is in the midst of a transition to a new politics of aspiration, 
to replace the politics of welfare. As these changes kick in, and in the end, democratic systems have a genius for self-correction, and when India finds the institutional horsepower of a great power, then the prospects for a substantial Australia-India strategic partnership will be bright indeed. Thank you. After that really masterly survey of Australia-India relations and deeply thoughtful account of contemporary India and its worldview, uh, Secretary Verghese has kindly agreed to take a few questions. So may I invite questions from the audience? Thank you, Mr. Verghese. Uh, a wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like your views on how you see India's evolving role in Afghanistan and also with China. Uh, and the implications for Australia. Um, recently, certainly on the, on the Chinese question, uh, there was an issue in, um, over the last few weeks where Chinese troops uh, um, came into, uh, as India would allege, uh, 19 kilometers into um, Indian territory. And uh, there's a claim by the Chinese that Arunachal Pradesh um, is now South Tibet, as it's depicted in their maps. Uh, that also follows um, some significant cyber attacks um, against the Tibetan government in exile. Um, as well as on Indian targets, as well as on some Australian targets, uh, a report from the University of Cambridge. So given the, the, that background, um, what are your views on the implications um, uh, for Australia of uh, the trajectory of India-China relations and also, uh, as a minor point, uh, uh, or a second point, um, India-Afghanistan relations? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I think the China-India relationship uh, like many relationships these days, is a very complicated one uh, in that it has uh, large elements of competition and it has large elements of interdependence on the economic side. Uh, and one of the great challenges that we face in the region and more broadly uh, is how we manage these ambivalent relationships that have both of those components. Um, I think there's a recognition in each country uh, that it's in their interest to have a constructive relationship with the other. Uh, and a recognition in each country that there is still enormous room for growth in the trade and investment relationship between the two. Uh, that sits side by side, obviously, with a lot of historical baggage uh, and a lot of traditional historical rivalry. Um, I think uh, for the, I, I don't think uh, we, we're likely to see a crisis point in India-China relations. I think uh, uh, sensible ideas will prevail, and I think the leadership of both countries will approach the relationship uh, sensibly. Uh, on Afghanistan, um, India, of course, uh, has the perspective of a regional actor as well as of a neighbor. Um, and uh, I think, obviously, for India, uh, what happens in Afghanistan is important to its security interests, uh, and there is also there a burgeoning uh, economic relationship. <clears throat> India has been a very active uh, participant in Afghanistan's economic development. It's uh, the provider of very significant aid. It's uh, conducted a lot of infrastructure projects in Afghanistan. Uh, I think uh, uh, India is uh, like many of us. Uh, looking to see uh, what will happen in Afghanistan uh, in the post-2014 period after the effective withdrawal of the, of the ISAF forces. But I think uh, there's an instinct in India uh, to uh, try and improve regional cooperation on Afghanistan uh, and to try and ensure, as a result, that uh, uh, Afghanistan can, consolid can consolidate the gains that it's gained up to now and not slip back into what's been a historical pattern of warlordism. You, you talked about three aspects, basically, in terms of the Oz-India relationship. One was patience and realistic expectations. And the second was getting the economic relationship right. Now, historically, uh, India has not been at the forefront of Australia's interests compared to China uh, over several decades. How do you see this relationship in terms of eco economics and trade? developing so that uh, there is some potential for Australia and India to catch up? Sure. Uh, 
Uh, well, I said in my remarks that I thought the economic relationship would be the load-bearing pillar of the relationship, and I think when you look at the next five or ten years, uh, that's where we're likely to see uh, the most growth and development in the relationship. I mean, what, what you have now with India is not dissimilar to what we had with Northeast Asia, which is a, an emerging structural complementarity between India's growth path and Australia's position as a supplier of uh, resources in the first instance, but over time expanding also to, uh, to services. Um, and the numbers are growing very fast. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, uh, rate of growth in the trade relationship, it may have slowed a little bit in the last 12 months or so, but the pattern over the last five or six years has been for very strong growth, 20 to 25% growth. Um, India is going to be uh, hungry for commodities. Uh, I think there are going to be real constraints on India's capacity to, to maximise its own resource base, and they go to questions of land acquisition and uh, infrastructure. Uh, and so uh, I can only see um, the commodities trade between the two countries getting much bigger. Uh, what we're beginning to see now is very serious Indian investment in the Australian resources sector. Uh, I mean, just two Indian investments, the GVK investment in the Galilee Basin and the Adani investment also in the Galilee Basin, are each worth $10 billion. So this is reshaping the investment relationship between the two countries when you're getting to those sorts of, uh, to those sorts of numbers. Uh, I think the prospects in the, in the services sector are, are, are very good. Uh, our four big banks are now operating uh, in India. Uh, and they see tremendous opportunities there. The insurance sector is only just starting. Uh, mining equipment, mining services. Uh, you, can, you can go through a list of, uh, of, of, of services where I think there'll be room for the, two, uh, for the two economies to do much, much more. Now, if we can get a, uh, an FTA or a closer economic cooperation agreement, uh, uh, as we're now calling it, um, I think that would be a good thing. It would have a head-turning effect uh, it would signal to our business communities that uh, the two governments, at least, are keen to make this relationship even bigger. But with or without an FTA, this relationship will get bigger uh, in trade and investment terms. Thank you. What is the likely shape of defence relationship uh, developing between India and Australia in the future? Again, I think this is an area where uh, we're likely to see uh, a growth in the defence relationship and a closer uh, strategic dialogue at the, at the policy level. Um, one of the points I made in my speech was that we have a fundamental congruence of strategic interests um, and uh, uh, we don't see uh, India's strategic trajectory as in any way cutting across uh, core Australian interests. Uh, I think the area where uh, there is most scope for us to do more together on the defence side uh, is, uh, is in the maritime field. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the strategic challenges of the future will, in many, many cases, be maritime challenges. Uh, and uh, it makes a lot of sense for Australia and India as two Indian Ocean countries uh, to be doing more together by way of uh, defence and particularly naval cooperation. Uh, so we would like to see uh, Australia conduct a regular exercise, a, a regular naval exercise uh, with India. Uh, we'd like to see a continuation, indeed, a, an expansion of the uh, strategic dialogue that we have on defence and security issues. Um, and uh, we would like to see um, uh, the, the range of defence contacts that we have with India uh, growing because uh, I think uh, uh, there is a, a fundamental uh, congruence of interests here that we should be building on. And if we're, going to, if we're going to establish a strategic partnership, it's going to need a number of different layers. Uh, the economic layer will play out with its own dynamic, uh, but I think it's going to need also a strategic layer to it as well most inspiring and interesting oration. My question to you is about Chogham. It's going to be in Sri Lanka this year, and Canada has already announced that they don't intend to participate. Australia is going to be there. So in terms of building a, 
strategic partnership with India. Is any conversation taking place about how to make this particular chogam in Sri Lanka a success? Uh, well, the Commonwealth is one of those issues that is naturally on the agenda of uh, Australia and India when we uh, discuss issues. Uh, we both have an interest in uh, ensuring that the Commonwealth is an effective institution. Uh, at the moment, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth is, uh, of course, from India. Um, so we will, we will uh, approach the Chogham meeting in Sri Lanka as part of the continuity from our year as chair to whatever comes next in the Commonwealth. Now, we did seek in the year that we had the chair to build uh, on the achievements of the Commonwealth. I think particularly the conclusion of the Commonwealth Charter uh, was a very important uh, development. Uh, and I think the way in which the Commonwealth now is uh, refining its capacity to deal with uh, issues, particularly through the so-called CMAG process, the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, which is able to pick up difficult issues within the Commonwealth and difficult issues within Commonwealth countries, um, I think, you know, is a, is a, is a positive development. So I, I, I think we'll be going to Sri Lanka reasonably like-minded with India. Two last questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mrs. Yeah. <laughs> And thank you for your talk. Um, with respect to India's uh, future, you see a, a, a possibility of enormous uh, economic growth and hopefully uh, further trade with Australia. How much do you see uh, corruption? Um, I know we have some corruption too, but how much do you see corruption in India, both at a political and, I suppose, in business, being a real handicap? Um, well, I think it's an issue that anyone doing business in India will obviously need to address. But more importantly, they need to have a very clear idea of what, what they will and what they won't do. Um, the, the view that the only way you could do business, and I'll apply this more generally, I won't apply it specifically to India. The view that in countries where corruption is a, a, a large problem, that the only way you can do business is uh, to be corrupt is not one that I share and certainly not one that we would advocate to uh, the Australian business community. Um, I think what this means is that if you're doing business with India, it's very important that you do a lot of due diligence and think very carefully about your partners in India. Uh, and it's very important that you start with a commitment uh, not to tolerate uh, corrupt behaviour. Um, Corruption in any society is something which uh, will take, I think, uh, time and patience uh, and commitment to deal with. And I think it's uh, one of those uh, facts of life that anyone operating in the environment uh, will, have to, will have to come to grips with. Natasha and the gentleman, and I'm afraid we'll have to conclude after that, Natasha. Uh, Peter, there has been a very slow progress in terms of uh, uranium being sold to India. Uh, would you think that uh, focus on Australian exports for uh, coal and gas would be the right way to go? Sorry, what was the last bit? The focus on Austra uh, sale of uh, coal and gas. Coal and uh, gas. Should that be the focus? Yeah. Oh, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, the progress may have been slow, but it's progress um, on, on uranium. And I think we've now uh, got to the point where both political parties in Australia uh, are committed to uranium sales to, to India. Uh, and um, I think that's an important development. I think uh, the Prime Minister showed uh, enormous leadership uh, to change the uh, Labour Party platform uh, at the end of uh, 2011. Uh, and it had a very, very uh, positive impact on the, on the bilateral relationship. Uh, and when you look at India's energy challenges, um, nuclear power will inevitably be uh, a part of its energy mix, uh, and therefore the prospects down the track, it's not something that's going to happen quickly, nor does, in, nor does India need uranium quickly, but it will be part of uh, uh, India's energy mix and part of our export mix to India um, down the track. Uh, 
Um, coal and gas, I think, will also be important uh, because when you're looking at the uh, demand for Indian energy over the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, it is a very uh, large appetite for, uh, for energy. So there's going to be room for uh, a number of different uh, energy types. And uh, coal, I think, will, uh, will continue to be uh, a big ticket item in our, um, uh, in our exports. Um, and uh, uh, the gas exports are only really at the beginning of uh, uh, a growth curve. We really only have one long term uh, gas contract with India. If you contrast that with what we have with Japan or Korea or China, um, uh, I think you'll get a bit of a glimpse of where the future with India on gas would be. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your time today, sir. Um, as you mentioned in your, um, in your speech, that there's a need for both countries to change um, their perception about each other, and you know we need to understand each other better. Um, definitely, Australia has a lot more to offer than just you know cricket and Shane Warne, and similarly, India can offer a lot more than just Bollywood. What is being done at a grassroots level to to um, improve this relationship? Thank you. Um, well, I should ask all of you what's done at the grassroots <laughs> level because uh, it's not a you know I mean I talk about what's done at the government level. Um, look, I, I think the pattern of uh, of migration from India to Australia is going to have a very big impact on what's done at the grassroots level. Um, if you've got a diaspora community here, which I said was you know, shy of half a million, um, that is creating a set of connections between the two countries, which will have a multiplier effect. Uh, and I think it's very important that, um, uh, you know, that that happens. Um, now, as a government, we've done a lot of things to try and facilitate um, more intense community to community connections and to try and address some of these gaps in perception which, uh, which I spoke about. I mean, we uh, have only recently finished a, a very major cultural promotion in India, Ozfest, uh, which um, was the biggest thing we've, uh, we've done in India. Um, and I think it had um, um, a good impact. I mean, you're not going to change perceptions through you know, one cultural festival, even, even off the scale um, of, uh, of Ozfest. But they're the sorts of things uh, that we've got to keep doing. I think the setting up of the institute, uh, funded by the government and contributed to by uh, three universities, uh, is important in terms of raising uh, the level of awareness of India. Uh, I think the Asian language program that uh, uh, has been um, articulated in the Asian Century White Paper. I think the adding of Hindi to uh, the Asian language program is uh, also an indication uh, of what we want to do. We're in the process at the moment of uh, writing the country strategies for the five big relationships in Asia, of which India is one. And part of that process for drafting the country strategy is to have uh, a series of meetings with uh, community groups, with stakeholders, with business people, with academia, with the commentariat. Um, so there's a lot happening, um, you know, but ultimately I think, you know, grassroots activity is in your hands rather than mine. Uh, before I conclude this session, uh, may I acknowledge uh, the presence and thank a few people. You know, Professor Susan Elliott, Deputy Chair of the Board and Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Professor John Dewar, Vice Chancellor of La Trobe University, one of our partner universities. Uh, Mr. Vipin Mahajan, who is the director of the Tuition Protection Agency, but also formerly a member of our board, and everyone else who's made it on this cold, rain, rainy Melbourne <laughs> evening. You'll all agree that we have had a fantastic session today, a most stimulating, inspiring oration. Indeed, I can't remember when I last heard someone capture uh, the essence of India, its Welton Shong, its worldview as well as the future and the past and present of the India-Australia relationship. So please join me in thanking Secretary Workies for that fantastic lecture.